In my quest to find more great side-scrolling action-adventure games from the 8-bit generation of gaming, an exclusive for the Sega Master System called Danin the Jungle Fighter came into view. The main character, Danin, was once the sole survivor of a plane crash when he was just a baby. He was found and raised by a local man named Jimba, and one day after returning home, Danin found Jimba on death's door. With his final breaths, Jimba urged him to find a prophet nearby, and so you begin the game on a vengeance mission, searching for what happened to the only family you've ever known, and end up on a twisting and turning subplot to save the world. More on that later. The game setting is a little strange. The instruction manual says it takes place on the planet Gian, which is supposed to be very much like Earth, but not quite. It has the same types of locations like deserts and mountains and even air that's almost the same, but the planet only takes 360 days to revolve around the sun instead of our 365. Huh. Throughout the game, you shuttle back and forth from being a loincloth wearing warrior fighting other warrior types to a fish out of water fighting people with modern weapons like guns and bombs. This contrast gave the game a bit of a weird tone, but it did keep me engaged wondering what surprises were coming next around the bend. Other action-adventure games plunk you down into their world and let you roam around at your own pace to figure out where to go and what to do next. Dane in the Jungle Fighter, on the other hand, dials up the pressure immediately by having a timer lording over you the moment you press start. The whole style of this game is a blend of arcade and adventure. There are timers and defined stages with a score tally at the end, but there are also features of traditional hack-and-slash adventure games with fantasy and RPG elements as well. Unfortunately, the game doesn't marry these aspects seamlessly, and that's in part due to the limitations that something like a timer can impose on a game with an experience system. You start out with a very small amount of health, and when that or the timer get depleted, you lose your life and it's game over. It's not game over and pick back up where you left off. No, it's game over for real. You don't retain any of your health or weapon upgrades, and finding them again and again with every death gets to feel pretty tedious. It's another one of those quests like Lord of the Sword where you're forced to do it all in one sitting since there are no saves, but this game's even worse since it also doesn't have any continues. On the bright side, Dane in the Jungle Fighter is much shorter overall if you know where to go, but when you're just learning the game, having to start over every time is really frustrating. Controlling Danin was not as fluid as I'd hoped. He moves faster than I expected, but the problem is that everything that's trying to kill you moves even faster. Lots of enemies, and especially their projectiles, are hard to avoid. Danin apparently decided to skip all of his flexibility training at the gym, so ducking rarely gets him out of the way in time. It doesn't help that you only have a small knife to fight with, and you have to get nice and close to things to hurt them. You can pick up more powerful knives as the game goes on, but you're never granted the luxury of a distance attack. Thankfully, some foes can be walked past or avoided altogether, while others seem to be unavoidable, and it really becomes a matter of outlasting everything around you as you get closer to the end of the game. Since you don't gain experience per enemy killed here, there's nothing but points to lose by steering clear of fights you don't need to engage in. Stage design in this game was pretty non-linear. There are lots of platforming elements involved, and once in a while the game threw out a curveball, like when you end up in this swimming section out of nowhere. Danin's sprite looks pretty great when he's walking and fighting, but there's something about his animation cycle while swimming and the fact that he's too huge to fit into most places underwater that made me grin from ear to ear in these parts. A muscular warrior swimming without using his arms and shanking fish left and right is a sight I didn't know that I wanted to see, but I'm glad I did. The only way to increase your character's health bar length and weapon strength is through exploration, and these critical things are missable if you're not thorough enough. These upgrades as well as other items are found in chests around each stage and are usually off the beaten path somewhere underground in a cave or in the basement of a building, for example. The manual makes it sound like it'll take a lot of hunting to find them, but it's really more just about keeping your eyes peeled for out-of-the-way places to get to, like a ladder going down or taking a leap of faith down a pit or off the screen to see where it goes. A good high jump made platforming a breeze and was helpful getting into those hard-to-reach places above Danin where chests were in plain sight but not reachable from the same level. This was a great time saver rather than taking a ladder or going through a building to get there, and I took every shortcut I could. The levels themselves are pretty compact and there are no mazes or long winding dungeons to wander through. 
If you take the time to check around, you'll have everything you need and then some. All items can always be found in the same places, so as you make note of their location, your time spent in each level gets more and more streamlined when you aren't wasting time opening up chests you don't need to. There are a couple of items that you can collect for points or to restore lost health, but another pickup with a monkey face gives you a tick on a bar in the pause screen that lets you call on an animal friend for help once you've accumulated enough of them. The most useful of the three is the chimpanzee that heals you, but this takes saving up nine monkey face icons to be able to use it. The armadillo is also great, but is only a short-lived defensive attack against nearby enemies, while the eagle is absolutely no good for nothing. It allows you to fly for a while, but since so many enemies are airborne or jump at you, it seems like it does more harm than good by putting you directly into the line of fire. I didn't find any places where the eagle revealed secrets above where Danin can usually reach, but there might be some out there. The major downfall to these animal companions is that they can't be used in boss battles. With only a little practice, I was able to hold my own for most of the game without their help, and I finished it without using them even a single time. It's also a bit funny that the manual stresses how Danin was friends with many members of the animal kingdom, but apparently only with these three because the rest of them want Danin dead. The boss fights were what really tested my patience and were single-handedly responsible for halting my progress while I was learning the game. With Danin's short attack range and hard to find hitboxes on the opponents, I had a really difficult time telling if I was even doing any damage. Some bosses flashed, sometimes they turned a different color when hit, and sometimes they did nothing. This lack of consistency made it hard to track any progress during a fight, and with no enemy health information available, the only way to tell was to keep trying until either you or the boss died. The difficulty curve was all out of whack here too. The boss fights could be classified as very easy, all the way through to those needing pixel-perfect precision to get anywhere, and they came down in no particular order. One of the last boss fights was poking a man bent over in the butt a couple of times with a knife, while the second one needed pretty much perfect execution, so much so that I died there more than anywhere else. The final boss was a total joke too, and for the sake of not spoiling anything, I'll just say that the final encounter was completely underwhelming given how much of a lead-up there was to the final showdown. Boss characters also served as vessels to unfold the story. There are these great exchanges between you and these other characters after each of the game's stages, and the plot is surprisingly philosophical and deep, sometimes a little too much to the point where it was a bit cringeworthy. The characters that challenge you throughout have their own motivations and aren't just out to kill you because someone else said to. They all have their own vested interests in what's happening in the world around them and are acting according to their own moral compass or a lack thereof, which is a nice change from the mindless drones acting on behalf of a bigger evil. One of the main characters that you quickly get mixed up with is Linda. Linda is weird. She appears to save you after you randomly tumble down into a pit, but by the looks of her excitement when you regain consciousness, it looks like she might have dug that pit as a trap all by herself with someone beautiful like Danan in mind. She becomes a regular throughout the adventure and has her own reasons to ally with you to stop the resurrection of an evil former warlord named Gilbus. Didn't you know? That's the real plot underlying your vengeance mission. It turns out that Jimba was killed because he was holding one of three sacred objects needed to raise the ultimate evil back into the world again, so you end up on a mission to find them all to stop that from happening. And you thought this game was going to be different from all the other adventure games out there. No, it's the same. The story was honestly one of the best parts of this game. Even though it was a bit convoluted with how complex and layered it got at times, it was well written and was suspenseful and way more profound than I was expecting. There were two problems that I had with these conversation cutscenes. The first is that there were a bunch of words and quotation marks like people's names or objects for no real reason that I could tell, which I found confusing. The other issue was that it was hard to tell who was talking sometimes. A few of these cutscenes had speech bubble indicators over whoever was speaking, but in others where you could just see the person Danan was speaking with as a little face in the corner, it wasn't so clear. To be fair, it's much funnier imagining these people having urgent conversations with themselves rather than with someone else. Despite being well done, these conversations could be awfully long-winded. Unlike other games where you're stuck listening to every single word unfold over and over each time you die, Dane in the Jungle Fighter actually allows you to skip the text. This is good if you're playing through for the billionth time, but obviously bad if you accidentally skip it since it doesn't repeat itself. 
One guy you meet right at the game's opening gave me the impression that there might be a second quest to try after finishing it. You're more or less forced into the land of Amazons because if you try to take the rugged path option, this guy tells you that you're not prepared for such a journey. After beating the game, I went back to see him again, but nothing changed. It turns out that if you bug him enough in any playthrough, he lets you take the rugged path, but it doesn't bring you anywhere exciting. You have to maneuver a bunch of difficult platforms and fall into pits that drain your life away, and eventually you end up right back in his hut and have to take the Amazon route through the regular game regardless. Why even make it appear like you have a choice if you can't change anything? It makes me wonder if there was a hard mode or a second path or loop in the works that got cancelled due to time constraints or something. Fortunately, other choices the game presents to you do have real consequences, like when a friend of Jimba's asks you to find the other sacred objects. If you say no, you automatically get a game over to teach you a hard lesson about honor. Even though Dane in the Jungle Fighter was fun while it lasted, overall the game felt unfinished. Being an adventure with such a well-developed and promising plot, it was sad to see it end almost as quickly as it began and also fizzle out with a really cheesy ending I could see coming from a mile away. I was able to finish the entire game on my fourth or fifth attempt through, making it approachable for a wide audience but also a little unfulfilling with only four levels to play through. Once you know where to go, there's not really much replay value unless you're going for a faster time or a higher score, which I found disappointing. With a few more levels and a bit more polish, this game could have easily become one of the greats from this generation.